Mathematics is divided into two areas. There, um, well, mathematics is divided into a number of areas. An important distinction is between discrete mathematics, which deals with things that can be counted, and continuous mathematics, which deals with things that can be measured. Linear algebra is the primary tool for discrete mathematics. Calculus is the primary tool for continuous mathematics. Clearly, the two cannot be connected, except when they are. An important result in analysis is known as Brouwer's fixed point theorem. Any continuous function from a set to itself has a fixed point. Remarkably, there's a proof of the fixed point theorem about continuous functions based on graph theory in discrete mathematics. The proof is based on the following idea. Suppose the vertices of a triangle are v0, v1, v2. If we have three non-negative values whose sum is 1, then the linear combination designates a point P in the triangle with barycentric coordinates xl, x1, x2. You could think of the location of P as a weighted average of the location of the vertices. For example, suppose we have a triangle with vertices 0, 0, 4, 0, and 2, 3. We can find and plot the points. We'll plot the vertices first. And as long as our barycentric coordinates are non-negative values whose sum is 1, and they are, a point will be inside the triangle. 0, 0, 1 corresponds to the linear combination 0 of the first, 0 of the second, and 1 of the third, and that gives us the point. And note this is just the vertex v2. 1 third, 2 thirds, 0 corresponds to the linear combination 1 third of the first, 2 thirds of the next, and 0 of the last, which will be And note that that's on the edge connecting v0 and v1. And finally, 1 fourth, 1 fourth, 1 half corresponds to the linear combination 1 fourth of the first, 1 fourth of the second, and 1 half of the third, and that's this point. The key things about the barycentric coordinates are the following. If any component is 1 with the other 0, then the object will be at the corresponding vertex. That's what happened in the case where our coordinates were 0, 0, 1. And if one component is 0 with the others having non-zero values, the object will be on the side joining the other two vertices. And that's what happened when our coordinates were 1 third, 2 thirds, 0. So now let's consider any triangle T with vertices v0, v1, v2, and any continuous function from T to T. And it's worth pointing out that we make no other assumptions on what type of function f is. It doesn't have to be differentiable. It doesn't have to be onto. It doesn't have to be one-to-one. -one. It just has to be continuous. Let x0, x1, x2 be the barycentric coordinates of a point p, and assume that f applied to this point gives us another point. We'll define Si to be the set of points in T where Xi prime is less than or equal to Xi. For example, X1 includes all points where X1 prime is less than or equal to X1, regardless of what happens to X0 or X2. Now, since the sum of the barycentric coordinates must be 1, then either the coordinates of a point are unchanged by our function, or at least one of the coordinates decreases. So every point in our triangle is in at least one of S0, S1, or S2. So now we can label every point in T with a 0, 
one or two, depending on which one it's in, and if the point is in more than one, we'll just choose one arbitrarily. Note that any point along one of the original boundaries must be in SI, where SI is one of the vertices. For example, any point on the 0, 1 edge will have barycenter coordinates XO, X1, 0. And since the sum must be 1, then either both are unchanged under F, in which case we'll have a fixed point, or one of them, say X1, decreases, in which case the point will be in S1. This means we can label any point on the 0, 1 edge with a 0 or 1, depending on whether the point is in S0 or S1. Also, note that the vertex V0 has barycentric coordinates 1, 0, 0, so it must be in S0, since X0 prime must be 1 or less than 1. So we'll label it 0. Likewise, V1 is in S1, and we'll label it 1. And V2 is in S2, so we'll label it 2. So now, form a simplicial triangulation of T. Each vertex of every triangle corresponds to a point labeled 0, 1, or 2. Note this is a properly labeled simplicial triangulation since every point along the boundary must have the same label as one of its end vertices. By Schwerner's lemma, there is an interior triangle with vertices labeled 0, 1, or 2. Since this will be true regardless of how small the triangles are, this gives us the following. Suppose f is a continuous function defined over the triangle, with points in the triangle labeled as described. There is an arbitrarily small triangle whose vertices are labeled 0, 1, 2. Now, at this point, we need to introduce some ideas from analysis, but since this is a graph theory lecture, we'll do some hand-waving and note that since f is continuous, there's some region around each vertex i where all points are in s i. And since the triangle is arbitrarily small, then at some point, S1, S2, S3 will intersect. Now, to keep my mathematician card from being revoked, I'll point out that this is based on the idea that F is continuous over a closed and bounded set, so it's uniformly continuous. And that means we can guarantee the neighborhoods overlap at some point. So now let's consider a point in this intersection where f applied to that point gives us new coordinates. But since it's into the intersection, then the xi primes must be less than or equal to the xi's. But since the sum of the coordinates is 1, the sum before and the sum after are equal, and so the only way for all three of them to be less than or equal to the originals is for all three of them to be equal, and so xo, x1, x2 is a fixed point, proving Brauer's theorem. 